and welcome back to Women vs Everything. I'm Jess, I'm here with my lovely co-host Grace and we are a podcast about women who overcame adversity and oppression. One of us goes away and researches a person in history, tells the other person these are the dates they were alive and these are the general themes of a story. The other person goes and researches those bits and then we sew it together on air and hope that makes sense and so far it has. Yeah, so far so yeah. good. So if you think that we are amazing, you can tell us that by emailing womenvseverything at gmail.com or finding us on any of the social medias. We are WV Everything Pod on Twitter, Women VS Everything on Instagram and Facebook. We're also at buymeacoffee.com slash WV Everything Pod and patreon.com slash women vs everything if you would like to throw money at us to help us keep doing what we're doing. Also, if you're a broke-ass bitch, you can <laughs> just generally tell your friends about us, save, share, like, comment on our social media stuff, hit subscribe on wherever you get your podcasts, download and comment on every episode, and that already helps with not just us, but also your algorithms so that you get more fun history podcasts. We're also on YouTube, so if you're someone who needs subs, can click subtitles on our YouTube videos. And again, also feel free to comment and screenshot ridiculous subtitle moments where YouTube has not understood my accent. Oh yes, I want to see the subtitle fails so much. I always forget that we're on YouTube, but I'm very glad that we are for that reason. Yeah, so... How are you, Grace? How are you doing? We're recording this on the 26th of August. We're a few weeks behind at the moment. And yeah, I was just saying to Jess, I'm not... I'm glad to be here, but like really struggling with a friend's passing through suicide in the last 24 hours. And I was going to cancel this and like postpone it till the time that was happier and when I can mask better. But, you know, I think one of the things we both wanted from this podcast at the start was for it to be mental health inclusive and honest and raw and it doesn't really get more honest and raw than than that yeah um, yeah I'm just so sorry and I hope that you're able to find time to take care of yourself and to get support and things that you need at the moment and yeah it's just it's just awful I'm just so sorry it's really hard because it's uh it was a friend in England so I'm just feeling very isolated from the community in terms of like I would just love to get a hug from someone and go for a coffee in the park and talk to someone who knew who remembers them and yeah yeah it's just it's difficult you know and and it's a difficult time you know they had covid recently oh gosh wow How yeah awful. i don't know if that um contributed but they were a very bright and bubbly person and i think struggling with the fatigue that follows covid was a bit difficult for them and yeah, I mean, check in on your friends, even check in on the friends you don't think need help and message people randomly and tell them you love them and what you love about them because it's, you know, life is just too short. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're struggling, please, please reach out for help. Uh, we will pop some resources in the show notes for this episode as well in case you need those. But please just... Uh, reach out to someone ask someone for help if you if you need it um don't go through don't go through stuff yeah. alone I recently put up um I just put up a post on Facebook actually about like I feel like a lot of people very verbatim kind of say like oh you know call the Samaritans and talk to your GP and stuff and you know I just want to like really say like it's not verbatim it's advice that works and you know I think something that's really weird about this for me is as you know I've been very suicidal at different times in my life and now I'm experiencing this from the other side and it, you know it is things like going to my GP and you know calling the Samaritans just to have someone on the phone to self-regulate or make noise and sound things out to or the rape crisis center or someone you know it's not going to fix everything but it's going to get you through the next few hours you know it's just going to make those feelings a bit quieter for a while and, you know, I've, I think sometimes as well, <sighs> friends won't explicitly know what you need unless you say how bad things are and ask, you know, and I'm definitely only here because I've had friends stay overnight with me at various points and meet me for food when I couldn't make any food for myself. And, you know, I just, your friends would sooner be slightly inconvenienced and worried for you than be mourning for you. And I'm, 
oh god I'm really feeling this like I'm like I I can't believe I ever considered putting people I love through this much pain so a big hug to everyone out there who's struggling and yeah fo just follow your feet follow your feet to the next right thing yeah do it for the people who love you if you can't do it for yourself yeah that's very good advice it's very important just sending so much love to you and to everyone <sighs> yeah and outside the cocoon of all that mess the world is still going on yeah we're still plodding along still in the ongoing covid times that just seem like they will last forever <sighs> yeah so you're in phd land oh yeah i am i am fully fully in phd land i am just like my entire life is my thesis right now um i wrote eighteen thousand words last week which was kind of a little bit bonkers still have more to do but i'm getting there yeah and just uh just keeping going with that really trying to get all of that done trying to get ready for my upgrade fiver mini halfway thing yeah you made a very grown-up decision last week where you're like I'm taking a break from everything but my PhD, which I was like, that's pretty, pretty rock and roll in terms of self-care. I, I did do that. Um, I did all of my client work for the month early before that, and then just sat down and did nothing except my PhD last week. And I was just like, if it's not my thesis right now, this week, it does not exist. Which was what I needed. And to be fair, I did, as I said, I did bash out a lot of words. How it went, I'll reserve judgment on until I've had feedback from my supervisors, but... Uh, I think it was good, actually. I think it was not all complete and utter nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aren't all PhDs? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm starting to feel like I can actually complete this thing and this isn't just completely bonkers thing that I got myself in for with no idea what I was doing. Excellent. So I was weird. I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, you know, what would you do if you'd extra money or whatever? And I was like, oh, I'd do a PhD. And then I was like, oh, that's, I'm actually the worst person ever. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's brilliant. Like, it's great. I love it. But it is also like, it does eat your life. Well, especially because you don't get enough funding to live on for it for so everyone I know was doing a full-time PhD as well as working yeah in certain subjects like particularly kind of the hard sciences it's a little bit easier to get more funding although it's by no means a given and my sciencey friends just when I started my PhD they were just saying oh where are you getting your funding from and I'm like funding laughs in art student <laughs> There is no funding. I'm entirely self-funded. It's ridiculous. I wish there was more out there for the arts and humanities like there is for the sciences with funding, but uh, this is what it is. I'm looking forward to an episode where we can interview you about your PhD. Oh yeah, we could do that. Hmm. I saw my family yesterday and I said I'm nearly halfway through my PhD now and my granddad said, does that mean that we have to call you doc? It's like half a doctor. <laughs> Have you done anything fun recently? I had a few fun things. I oh, had good. some mini breaks. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I went to Wexford and Dublin. Oh, lovely. And Mitchellstown, which is only an hour away. It was really good. It was really nice to just be in other houses. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Other bedrooms. They were all my first time away from my home overnight in a year. Wow. Considering I used to pop into London every month, a bit of a lifestyle change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was really good. And it was so great to spend quality time with friends and also really exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's taken me half the week to kind of recover from like from the trip to Dublin because we did like a lot of hiking and a lot of stuff. You can like check out my Instagram. I've got lovely photos of the hill walking we went on and stuff like that. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. I'm really glad you had a good time. That sounds lovely. And you, did you meet your parents somewhere nice? Uh, I went over to their place to see them. And I got to see my nephew, who I haven't seen in almost a year, which is quite a while considering that he's only 18 months old. Aww. So that was really lovely. And then on Tuesday, I saw my best friend for the first time since before the pandemic. And we had a really lovely day in Leicester, drank a lot of coffee and caught up and ate some nice Indian food. Um, and it was great. And he said he's going to listen to the podcast. So, hey, Josh, I love you. Hi, Josh. <laughs>
Yeah, so that was really great. And uh, oh, and my partner and I have just booked a trip. We're going on an actual holiday in October. Oh, where are you going? Which is really exciting. Yeah, we discovered that it's actually super easy to go to France now that you're now that we're vaccinated. We just have to do a couple of tests on the way back. There's no like quarantine restrictions or anything. So yeah, we're doing a little COVID safe actual holiday off of Tory Island. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Um, so tell us tell us about the house. I'm closing on my own house next week. That is so exciting. I'm I'm so happy for you. Mm. Well, it's a it's a duplex apartment. It's turnkey as well, so it's like really freshly painted. Carpets are lovely. I'm buying most of the furniture. Like it's it's all the best bits of renting a furnished <laughs> house. <laughs> yeah, like everything is is set up because the people that owned it are moving back to Poland, and mm. they're so lovely. And I just went over yesterday to look at the furniture I was going to buy off them, and I was just like. I'll take everything, like, just just leave it, you know? Because I think, yeah, because I love selling stuff on Facebook Marketplace as well. So it's like, <laughs> I'm just so excited. I might potentially be getting a pet bunny. <gasps> Amazing. I and I have, you know, the most important detail is my first party, which is going to be the first weekend of October, which will be a joint birthday slash housewarming party. So exciting. I cannot wait to come and visit you and see the new house and record in your new house. That's going to be exciting. Yes, I, I uh, haven't quite decided where the podcast recording area is going to be yet. But um, <laughs> If you're moving in next week, then that probably means that the next time we record, you will be there. Oh my God, that's so exciting. Yes, that will be amazing. This may surprise you, but my choice of interior decoration is a bit what some people might turn too much. <laughs> <laughs> Extra, if you will. <laughs> yes. If you leave my house without a cluster headache, I have failed. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Shall we dive into today's topic? Do you want to talk about the uh, the details I gave you? Yes, absolutely. So the woman we're going to discuss today lived in the south of England between the 1880s and 1940s. And the themes to research were lesbianism, gender fluidity, possible trans mask identity... This is like reading my Twitter profile. Um, <laughs> literary censorship and obscenity, casual, a consensual-ish, maybe non-monogamy. Do we have any trigger warnings, Jess? Um, the biggest trigger warning for this one is is homophobia. Do you want to do the big reveal and tell us the name of the person we're going to discuss today? Yeah. So today we are talking about Radcliffe Hall whose full name was Marguerite Antonia Radcliffe Hall. She was an English poet and author, and she was best known for a novel called The Well of Loneliness, which was a groundbreaking work in uh, lesbian literature. And it is exactly as depressing as the name implies. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did my undergraduate thesis on lesbian historical fiction, and I read The Well as part of that, and it is precisely as depressing as the name implies. So Radcliffe, as an adult, often went by the name of John and usually wore masculine clothing. She's generally been historically described as a lesbian, although it's possible that she might have uh, actually identified as a trans man if that concept had been kind of a around and, and known at the time. And there's, there's still disagreement around whether she was a lesbian or he was a trans man. I'm probably going to mostly use she, her pronouns throughout this because that's what most of the historical sources use. But I think it's important that we need to acknowledge that we're talking about someone whose true gender is is ambiguous. We don't really know for sure. And there's kind of evidence in both directions. So just something to keep in mind with this. And similar to our James Barry episode, this is not some sort of turfy denial or reason to deny trans identities and if you're going to twist our words to make that point then you know stop listening yeah exactly you can't sit with us yes we are a trans positive podcast i think one of the other things that we need to acknowledge is that like even if you know we assume that it's possible that this person was a was a trans man they would still have experienced misogyny. They would still have been subject to kind of oppression under the patriarchy in yeah. those times and indeed today, sadly. And this podcast is women versus everything. But I'm very happy to be like, this is just not cis men versus everything. <laughs> 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 that if we discuss trans masks or they thems or whatever, we are not, you know, saying therefore they were a woman, a woman by having them on this. 
Yeah, exactly. We might jump around a little bit between pronouns on this one. Most of the sources do use she, her pronouns. So yeah, did you find anything interesting out about kind of the time or what the, what society was like for women in the in that time? So this is going to overlap a lot with our Emily Wilding Davison episode yes. because they were knocking around around the same time. Yeah. So do we say Radcliffe or John? Um, we can use them interchangeably. Most okay. of the, the sources say Radcliffe, but we can we can use either. Okay. We can use them interchangeably. So Radcliffe was born in the eighteen eighties, which was the last kind of twenty years of the Victorian era. The Victorian era is kind of golden days of Britain, post industrial revolution. The middle class came into existence. Britain had a status of a global superpower. The abolition of slavery in the West Indies and African possessions was around this era. The end of transportation of convicts to Australia, loosening restrictions on colonial trade, and introducing responsible government. So, you know, England's really trying to be nice at this time. Broadly not doing a great job, but trying. I mean, uh, that's more than they're doing right now. Come on. Um, Fair. So there was also a lot of poor sanitation. So this was a time when it was pretty shit to be a woman, because you're just seen as this, like, upholder of the nuclear family very much in service to the husband and you shrank your own identity and status and everything to allow your husband and children to come first women really avoided the public sphere apart from in religion there was some non-conformist churches gave roles in sunday schools and visiting the sick and elderly and poor distributing track uh fundraising and they would lead some class meetings, pray with other women, and the more progressive churches led them to preach to mixed audiences. The last episode talked about this poem, The Angel of the House, which is really this this thing of like a woman's job when her husband came home from work was to spare him from, you know, the difficulty of his own children <laughs> and his own decisions to run a house like he should come home and just be pampered and so women's suffrage had been around for 20 years before this before Radcliffe was born since um 60, 1867 so Radcliffe would have been born into a time where women were able to attend certain colleges and take exams but it wasn't until the 1890s they could study and sit the same exams alongside men mm. and it wasn't until 1948 after Radcliffe had died that they could get degrees which is really sad that is really um, sad yeah mm. um, and we we did talk about that in the uh, Emily Wilding Davison episode as well didn't yeah. we yeah women not being awarded degrees and, and this is really yeah. shocking how how recent that all is yeah absolutely and there was um we had the steamboat ladies which was you know Trinity College in Dublin started awarding women degrees based on their previous exam results which resulted in a lot of women getting on the boat over to Ireland to be able to get their degrees which is yeah. fantastic so that's the kind of world that Radcliffe would have been born into and the kind of role that they would have seen women around them have in their formative years while they're growing up and soaking up information around them about society and what's allowed and what's not allowed I think they were quite middle were they middle upper class were they born into a rich family yeah, so, so Radcliffe was born in 1880 to a uh, wealthy father who had inherited a substantial amount of money from his father, but their father abandoned them in 1882. So Radcliffe was only two years old when her father left. Her mother remarried, but she had a bad relationship with both her mother and her stepfather. And that was largely because her mother made it clear that uh, she was unwanted because she'd failed to get an abortion during pregnancy. That's really interesting. So like... At the time, I can see why her mother jumped straight into another marriage. Single mothers were the poorest in society and they were really disadvantaged. Women lived longer, which meant they were often widowed with children. Yeah. They had fewer opportunities to work. And when they did, their wages were worse than men's. And not remarrying meant you're the main provider on this meagre wage, basically. And a lot of poor women actually had deficient diets because there was this whole thing again that like you sacrificed yourself for your children and your husband you always put them first so there was many women who were just completely malnourished and didn't have access to health care abortion was the most widespread form of birth control especially amongst working class women and middle class women yeah even though it was of course still illegal in those days absolutely so contraceptives were illegal unreliable and expensive so it was kind of like abortion was seen as a more effective way if you're going to invest your money in that 
Yeah, but of course it was often dangerous as well because it wasn't being performed in proper sanitary conditions or anything. So many, many, many women would have been yes. seriously maimed or even died as a result of botched abortions. Yes, so you could get a surgical abortion, which was illegal, not performed by physicians, and performed by women using crochet hooks. Ah. Oh, I know. Or you could purchase abortifacients, abortifacients, which were advertised in papers covertly like they would be advertised as a feminine hygiene product, mm. you know, or feminine medicine. But they could be just snake oil and not effective at all. So, I mean, that's poor child Radcliffe having to listen to that is an intense amount of trauma growing up from your mother. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very interesting what you were talking about with regards to kind of how women were very much expected to marry, to form a nuclear family and to, to play that very specific role. And Radcliffe kind of realised that due to inheritance, money from their father, that they could kind of avoid that kind of had enough money to not have to work or to marry in order to survive. So this source says she began to do as she pleased, dressing in typical men's fashions of the time, which included trousers, monocles and hats, and spent much of her 20s pursuing relationships with women that were eventually she lost to marriage. Eventually those women would go and go and marry men and she would lose them to that, which is quite sad really. Yeah, I so god, it must have been a real innate drive. I mean if we're talking about nature versus nurture here around someone wanting to be gender non-conforming and have relationships with the same gender because lesbianism was just completely invisible within Victorian society from what I could read from my limited research. There was laws against it because in medieval Europe, the Christian church developed by Celtic monks in Ireland. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, they had a strict view about same-sex relationships and they had penitentials which were in like unofficial guidebooks and the British kind of like they love to do like adopted that and said that's our idea and the books listed crimes and then the penances done for them like so he who commits the male crime of sodomites shall do penance for four years and then there was several versions made of that until one in the seventh century which made references to lesbianism if a woman practices vice with a woman she shall do penance for three years and then this also spread to mainland Europe but there was kind of no explicitness about lesbian activities if they were mentioned at all compared to male homosexual activities yeah so we're seeing like an invisibility about this yeah i read a really interesting article about this actually which we'll link to which is on open learn yeah and it says that there's never been a specific offense criminalizing lesbianism but it doesn't necessarily mean that women weren't prosecuted for same-sex relationships and it certainly doesn't mean that it was accepted or something that was openly kind of talked about. So it's this real kind of cloaking of this whole thing in, in silence and in invisibility coupled with the fact that it is, you know, sort of criminalised as well. The term that was used at the time, this is really interesting, there was this concept that was described as sexual inversion, which was a term that sexologists in the kind of late 19th, early 20th century used to refer to what today we would think of as as homosexuality and it says it was believed to be an inborn reversal of gender traits so male quote-unquote inverts were inclined towards traditionally female pursuits and dress and vice versa there was this one sexologist who described female sexual inversion what now we, we might call lesbianism as quote the masculine soul heaving in the female bosom <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's this very kind of rigid understanding of gender. Yes, very binary. Yeah, it's this very rigid, very binary understanding of gender. So what we would now think of as gay or possibly bisexual identity is being wrapped up in this idea of someone feeling that they're physically male or female, but internally mm. that they are maybe the opposite biological sex and that's why they're attracted to people of their own sex or similar genders so this is where we see like probably not even as far back as it goes but like the, the whole thing of like your sexuality being completely intertwined with your gender identity yeah absolutely whereas now we i think we kind of have a lot more understanding that they're connected but they're, they're also sort of separate things as well yeah and that it's far more of an individual experience you can't really make these sweeping statements about an entire diverse population anymore yeah exactly and of course now we have much more understanding that you know pursuits and dress and things like that aren't necessarily very rigidly tied to a specific gender things that women do and things that men do doesn't really make a huge amount of sense yeah 
outside of the construct of very rigid societal gender roles. So do you want to hear a really ridiculous hashtag not how women work thing? Yes. There was an Italian surgeon, William of Bologna, attributed lesbianism to a, quote, growth emanating from the mouth of the womb and appearing outside the vagina as a pseudo-penis. What? <laughs> right? I mean, that's hot. Uh, I mean, you know, but, <laughs> but not real. <laughs> I have so many questions. Wow. Yes. So that's from the Wikipedia page about the history of lesbianism. So yeah, I think again, where we have a lot of these issues about sexuality and gender is also because, you know, it was being studied and written about by by men who had no yeah. fucking idea about our experience. There is also this really interesting point that the English law largely ignored female homosexual activity, not out of indifference, but out of male fears about acknowledging and reifying it. Right. There was almost this idea that if they criminalised it, then women would learn that it existed and get ideas. <laughs> right? Be like, I didn't know that was an option. Yeah, right, exactly. And it seems like this article I mentioned said that basically the same thing, that this was a very big fear. There's a bit here that says, the law kept silent about it because those ruling class men did not want respectable women, their wives and daughters, to find out. <laughs> this is where we see this thing again about women being so delicate and they just need to be, like, protected, you know? <laughs> like, from well, even yeah. knowing about anything. Right, no, exactly. It's really quite strange and it, it speaks to this very this idea of women as these like innocent delicate flowers who need to be as you say protected from even the knowledge that these things exist yeah i mean by that logic it's like it's not until i heard that it was illegal to shoplift that i realized i could shoplift you know <laughs> yeah exactly and then i went and did it that day <laughs> This relates to the obscenity trial, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but there was a quote here that said that one of these witnesses declared that homosexuality ran in families and a person could no more become it by reading books than he could become syphilitic by reading about syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like he's just, just completely debunking this idea that someone can somehow become queer just by learning that queerness exists, which honestly I think is something that we're still seeing today because there's all these arguments with regards to kind of inclusive sex education and that sort of thing where people are saying, oh well, if you tell children that these things exist, then they'll just decide to be queer. Yeah. And so, okay, firstly, that wouldn't be a problem because it's not a bad thing, but that is still tied up in the premise that it's preferable to be straight and cis. But exactly. It also just makes no sense because that's not how identity works. Yeah, um, Glennon Doyle has an amazing bit in her book called Untamed, where, you know, someone asks her this question, you know, she has done a lot of the Christian circuits, she's had an amazing life, and yeah, someone said, you know, my like, seems like all my grandkids' friends now are trans and everything else, and, and she was like, well, freedom is contagious, you know, mm. so if, yeah, when we give people the freedom to be themselves, that's what's motivating them. Yeah. It's not about being afraid people will corrupt, it's like being afraid of people getting the choice and not doing what you want. Right, exactly. And this theme of giving people the freedom to be who they are is going to come up again a little bit later in this. Yeah, there was an interesting case I came across, an English 18th century person called Mary Hamilton. Oh, okay, interesting. Who was a bit of a con artist under the name of Charles Hamilton. She was punished for fraud, but wasn't at all considered to have committed sex crimes by the court or the press at the time. So they were basically, like Mary Hamilton was basically living life and marrying women as a man yeah it was the fraud that, that rather than the the sexuality oh that's that's so interesting we yeah we, we have to do a whole episode on that that's so interesting yeah yeah so it's just again it's this thing of like we're not really talking about that side of it we're going to talk about how she swindled these helpless women out of money you know yeah because marriage was a financial transaction in those days mm-hmm so was Radcliffe at all involved with the suffragettes? Because the time they were alive is kind of the time that all that was going on. Basically not really, to be honest. Like, I couldn't find anything in her story that referenced any kind of involvement with, with the suffragettes. So no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so is the short answer, at least not in any kind of active way. That's interesting. Which is interesting, yeah. So in 1907, she would have been 27 at the time, she met a woman called Mabel Batten, who was a well-known amateur singer 
who was 51, so age gap relationship representation. Batten was married with an adult daughter, adult grandchildren, but they fell in love, um, and after her husband died, they set up home together. And it was Batten who introduced uh, Radcliffe to a circle of her kind of artistic and intellectual friends, most of them women, many of them lesbians. And she was also the first person who gave them the nickname of John, after seeing resemblance to a picture of one of Radcliffe's male ancestors, presumably with that name. And it was also Batten who originally encouraged Radcliffe to start publishing their poetry. Wow, that's a healthy relationship. Yeah, it seems like it really was. Although, well, mm. so in 1915, Radcliffe fell in love with a woman called Una Vincenzo, who was Lady Trowbridge, who was Batten's cousin, which is interesting. She was an artist in her own right. She was a sculptor. And she was married to a man called Vice Admiral Ernest Trowbridge, although by the time that he was knighted in 1919, they were already legally separated. So it sounds like kind of by the time this relationship began, her marriage was functionally kind of over. And Trowbridge wrote about the intensity of her relationship with Radcliffe in her diary. And there's a quote here that she wrote that reads, I could not, having come to know her, imagine life without her. Mm. And that was date three. No one has <laughs> relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and it says that there was tension between the three women until Mabel Batten died in 1916. So and then this is where I said sort of consensual-ish non-monogamy, maybe? It sounds like it was yeah. tolerated rather than kind of embraced. But uh, anyhow, so Radcliffe and Una Trowbridge began living together in 1917. And for several years, they lived at this house in Holland Street in Kensington. And they stayed together until, until Radcliffe's death. We'll hear a little bit more about their later kind of relationship and, and their life together later on. But yeah, so it was this very kind of intense relationship that lasted for, for many, many years. Wow. Yeah. So Radcliffe published five books of poetry between 1906 and 1915, and then a novel called The Unlit Lamp in 1924, which is interesting. Um, so the novel follows a woman who wants to set up a flat in London with her friend in something called A Boston Marriage which is described as the cohabitation of two wealthy women independent of financial support from a man, which, you know, some may or may not interpret mm -hmm. as a lesbian relationship. Yeah. So this source says, its length and grimness made it a difficult book to sell. Remember that, <laughs> that will be important later. So Radcliffe chose a lighter theme for her next novel, which was a social comedy called The Forge, but she'd used her full name for earlier poetry work and then shortened it to M. Radcliffe Hall for The Forge, but the unlit lamp, which was the next one to go into print, was the first one that had her name printed simply as Radcliffe Hall. Was this that she was pretending to be a male author? Well, it's interesting because I don't, I don't think so. It is a sort of gender ambiguous name, which may have mm. been kind of part of the appeal. But it sounds like she was fairly public about who she was and was kind of known as who she was. Okay as, you know, being seen as a woman. So I don't, I don't think so, although I, it, is a, it is a gender ambiguous name, which is interesting. Novelist was like one of the few kind of jobs that was seen as appropriate for a woman to have at that time. Yeah. But, you know, there's still women authors right under male names today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To avoid certain levels of discrimination and judgment. So I was just wondering... Yeah. She published another comic novel and then another novel that sounds like it was kind of, I don't even know what genre you would put this under, it's described as a novel about an Italian headwaiter who, becoming disgusted with his job and even with food itself, gives away his belongings and lives as a hermit in the forest. <laughs> it's a very interesting premise for a story. It's kind of rejecting like what you know in society and what's been forced on you again. Yeah. Um, so 1926, she's kind of at the height of her career. She's, her work's doing really, really well. This book, Adam's Breed, has become a bestseller. Uh, she's winning a bunch of awards. And at this point, she decides that she's going to write a novel dealing with homosexuality or sexual inversion, as she referred to okay. it. She believed that her literary re reputation was strong enough at that point that she could kind of get away with it, or at least at least people would kind of hear her out and, and read the work, and thought that it was possibility that it would result in, quote, the shipwreck of her whole career. She sought the blessing of her partner, Una Trowbridge, before she started working on the novel, but very much kind of wanted to... She had a very clear agenda with this, which was to kind of end this public silence and shame around homosexuality and uh -huh. to kind of bring about more understanding in society, which is, which is a very, very ambitious goal in the 1920s. I mean, <laughs> oh, what a rock star. Yeah, absolutely. She went to her editor 
1928 when the book was finished and essentially said that she wouldn't allow anything in the book to be changed. It had to be published as it was. There's this quote where she's said to have, have told them, I have put my pen at the service of some of the most persecuted and misunderstood people in the world. So far as I know, nothing of the kind has ever been attempted before in fiction. Beautiful. Yeah. And this book was The Well of Loneliness which follows the life of an English woman from an upper middle class family who uh, has a male name, interestingly, the character's name is Stephen. Ah. It's very obvious that she's a lesbian from an early age. She meets another woman, fall in love, but they can't be happy together because of the social isolation and rejection that they suffer. And the novel very much portrays homosexuality as, as kind of a natural state, something that's ingrained in a person from birth. And this is a quote from the book that is, Give us also the right to our existence. Mm. Yeah, it's really sad, actually. I remember reading it when I was at uni, and I remember like like reading this book, and I, and I was like, I am so depressed right now. This is so sad, and I need... To, yeah. Because invisibility is also another form of violence. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. That, you know, we can talk about how gay men had it worse because they were more visible and punished harsher for their crimes and everything. But like the denial of existence is like a psychological torture. Yeah, and I thought that right to our existence thing was just really, really powerful in this time. They started trying to get the novel published. Three different publishers were complimentary about it, but ultimately turned it down. It was ultimately a publisher called Jonathan Cape who took it on. He obviously knew that it was going to be controversial, but he also saw that it could make a lot of money. So he tested the waters with a small print run. They printed 1,500 copies and they priced them, and this is really interesting, they priced them at 15 shillings, which was about twice what an average novel would cost. Ah. Supposedly to make it less attractive to people who were just looking for cheap sensation, titillation, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. Oh, interesting. This book is not sexually explicit at all. Like, even yeah. remotely, it's the most... <laughs> there's one line that reads... She kissed her full on the lips as a lover. And there's another line that reads, And that night they were not divided. That's it. Wow. That is as sexually explicit as this book gets. No, it sounds emotionally explicit. <laughs> yeah, it's emotionally intense, but it's like, it's like so chaste. So they actually brought the publication forward slightly, which is interesting because they found out that there was a book coming out by uh, Sir Compton Mackenzie which was also supposedly going to have lesbian themes and they wanted to beat it to market. Yeah, I got one written by an actual lesbian, not, you know, I'm presuming not a sir. Yeah. Yeah. They brought the publication forward. They sent review copies to journalists and reviewers that they thought would not just sensationalise the subject matter, mm -hmm. essentially. Wow. The reviews were very mixed. Some people kind of said that it was too preachy. Some people said that it was poorly structured, sloppy in style. Which, you know, mm, having read it is, yeah, it's kind of valid, to be fair. But there was very few issues at this point with the subject matter. Most people kind of thought that this was fine. This was, you know, tastefully handled or whatever. Wow, great. Yeah, and apparently she received like thousands of letters or, or communications from readers who were outraged when the book was being tried and banned, which we'll talk about in a minute, and kind of found, you know, real value in this story. So there was obviously a need for this at the time. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that some people have speculated that the book is a thinly veiled autobiography, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of actual evidence for that. I was wondering, I mean, it definitely would have autobiographical elements. Yeah, absolutely. So Hall is quoted as saying that she drew on herself only for the, quote, fundamental emotions that are characteristic of the inverted, but that ultimately her story bore very little resemblance to the main characters beyond that. Calling it drawn from her experience is fair, I think calling it autobiography is. So then this man came along. Duh! A yeah. straight man had an opinion. Yes. Uh, his name was James Douglas. He was a journalist and a critic and the editor of the Sunday Express. He was also into something called muscular Christianity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen that porno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a It's a branch of Christianity that promotes like physical fitness and physical health and like quote unquote manliness. <laughs> It's really quite interesting. I never knew that was a thing until like this morning when I was writing up my notes for this. <sighs> and isn't your life better for knowing it? <laughs> oh, like I needed that expression in my life. I'm trying to think of a really awful right-wing journalist, right-wing tabloid journalist today. There are so many. 
Um, he was one of them, anyway. He, he wrote, this source describes them as colourfully worded editorials on subjects such as, quote, the flapper vote, which was his take on <laughs> suffrage for women under 30. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that um, sounds like correctly sensationalised synopsis from a yeah. man of the movement for the right to vote. Yeah. Do you want to hear what he had to say about the well when he read it? Go on. He said, and I quote, The adroitness and cleverness of this book intensifies its moral danger. It is a seductive and insidious piece of special pleading designed to display perverted decadence as a martyrdom inflicted upon these outcasts by a cruel society. It flings a veil of sentiment over their depravity and even suggests that their self-made debasement is unavoidable because they cannot save themselves. That was in a piece titled A Book That Must Be Suppressed, which was published in the Sunday Express on the 19th of August 1928. Yeah, so it's not enough that I don't like this book, you must not like it too. Oh, yeah, this man was, like, mm-hmm. the worst. He decided that the, the commonly held view of sexologists at the time about homosexuality was uh, pseudoscience, which was incompatible <laughs> with Christian doctrine. <laughs> yeah, and he believed that homosexuals were damned by their own choice, and that, again, this comes back to what we were saying earlier, that uh, others could be corrupted by their, quote, propaganda. So he would be anti-mask and anti-vax today, right? Oh, 100%. He's quoted as saying, I would rather give a healthy boy or healthy girl a vial of prussic acid rather than this novel. Poison kills the body, but moral poison kills the soul. Fun fact, prussic acid is cyanide. What? This is wild. He was so, like, religious right, oh my god, the gays are going to corrupt the children. Yeah, I would sooner have a dead child than support my trans child. Yeah. Yeah. So... Interestingly, he was kind of in the minority. He was backed by a few other kind of papers and, and, and journalists, but actually the majority of the British press defended the book. There was an article in The Nation that suggested that this whole campaign against it had only started because it was, quote, silly season when journalists are just writing about anything because there are no good stories. Okay. No, someone said that no one would give the book to a child, no child would want to read it, and any who did would find nothing harmful, which, valid. Yeah. There was actually a lot of support, um, and there was also a lot of support in favour of the book and protesting against its protesting against it, its its censorship from kind of well known literary figures at the time. So uh, people like Leonard and Virginia Woolf, E. M. Forster, T. S. Eliot, Vera Britton, they were all kind of involved in drafting this letter that was originally supposed to protest against the suppression of this book. But this plan kind of broke down because Radcliffe objected to the wording of the letter and wanted it to mention oh, no. her, her book's, quote, artistic merit, even genius. <laughs> yeah, and not everyone who was willing to defend it was willing to defend its quality. They were defending it on the grounds of literary freedom rather than on the grounds that it was good. Freedom of speech, yeah. It's kind of like it's only okay to have freedom of speech if it's really well written. Like, what the fuck? yeah. So in the end, there was just this short letter that was signed by E.M. Forster and Virginia Woolf, which focused on the effect of censorship on writers. Do you want to hear what they had to say? Yes. They said, A novelist may not wish to treat any of the subjects mentioned above, but the sense that they are prohibited or prohibitable, that that is a taboo list, will work on him and will make him alert and cautious instead of surrendering himself to his creative impulses. And he will tend to cling to subjects that are officially acceptable, such as murder and adultery, and to shun anything original lest it bring him into forbidden areas. So they're basically saying that censorship ruins creative process, which is... Yeah, so Radcliffe wanted to censor their letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interestingly, or at least to like have it phrased in a very specific way. Oh my goodness, what is that? Like, ugh. Yeah, so against Radcliffe's wishes, the publisher Jonathan Cape sent a copy of the book to the Home Secretary for his opinion and said that they would withdraw it if the Home Secretary decided that it was within the public interest to do so. And this was, uh, the Home Secretary at the time was someone called William Joyce and Hicks, and he was a conservative. He was known for cracking down on things like alcohol, nightclubs, gambling, and also for uh, his opposition to a revised version of the Book of Common Prayer. A barrel of laughs. Yeah. Two days later, yeah. he came back and said the book was, quote, gravely detrimental to the public interest, 
and that they would bring criminal proceedings against the publisher if they didn't withdraw it from sale. What? Yeah. Why did the publisher even do this? Were they just covering their own ass? I, I, it must have been. It's really bizarre. So Hall is quoted as describing this as a act of imbecility coupled with momentary panic by her publisher. So yeah, I think he's just like freaked out and gone, oh God, let's get, let's cover our asses here. And it's kind of backfired. So they stopped publishing it. They secretly leased the rights to a publisher in France, an English language publisher in France. But then this press in France started shipping its edition of the book back to London. In October of that year, this uh, Home Secretary issued a warrant that any shipments of the book into the country should be seized, which resulted in a shipment of 250 copies being seized at Dover. But the chairman of the Board of Customs protested against that at this point because he'd read the book, he didn't think it was obscene, and he didn't want to have a part in suppressing it. Mm -hmm. He actually released the copies that had been seized to a bookseller called uh, Leopold Hill. But the Metropolitan Police found out, got a search warrant, and this bookseller and also the publisher were summoned to appear at the magistrate's court to essentially make their case for why the book should not be censored. Wow. Yeah. It's completely wild. So then, 9th of November 1928, this so th- this is all in like the three months after this has been published. Three so, so months? The, yeah. So the obscenity okay. trial starts. The publisher's solicitor sent out around 160 letters to potential witnesses, but most of them didn't want to appear in court. Yeah. But about 40 did, which included Virginia Woolf, E.M. Forster, and a few other interesting, interesting and very diverse group of people. None of them were allowed to offer their views on the novel, because under the Obscene Publications Act of 1857, the chief magistrate could decide whether or not the book was obscene without actually hearing any views on the matter who could just decide it was obscene which is ridiculous so they were called as witnesses but then not allowed to give their opinion yeah basically yeah or at least specifically not allowed to give their opinion on whether the book itself was obscene which was the point of the trial jesus christ the publisher's barrister argued that the relationship between the women in the book was purely platonic <laughs> like okay to which the chief magistrate replied i have read the book <laughs> So he's like, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, that's not gonna work. So, uh, so the the barrister, a man called Norman Burkett, he uh, he retracted that statement, and then he instead argued that the book was was tasteful, that it had literary merit, and that it was not obscene, and it was not supposed to be sexually explicit, but it was to examine this social issue. But all of this failed, and the magistrate decided that the book was indeed obscene. Okay. He described the book as. A defence of unnatural practices between women. Oh. Yeah. Said that the book's literary merit, merit was irrelevant because a well-written obscene book was more harmful than a poorly written one. So the whole literary merit thing kind of backfired <laughs> a little bit. And he said that all copies of the book should be destroyed. Jesus. So Radcliffe and her publisher appealed. They appealed to something called the London Court of Quarter Sessions to have this uh, verdict overturned. But after only five minutes of deliberation, they upheld the decision. Fucking hell. Yeah. So they had their mind made up already. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was like, yeah. not that, yeah, they never had a chance. Yeah. There was also a, a series of legal challenges in the US, particularly there was one in New York State that went on for a while, and then there was in the uh, US Customs Court as well, but those actually failed. So this is interesting. In the US, there was something called the Hicklin Test of Obscenity. Hmm. And there was this case law that had established that books should be judged on their effects on adults rather than on children, and that literary merit was relevant. Wow. Yeah, so they failed to censor it in the US under those rules, which was which was really interesting. The United That's, States Custom yeah. Court found that the book did not contain, quote, one word, phrase, sentence or paragraph, which could be truthfully pointed out as an offensive to modesty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very PG-13. Like, it's not explicit, it's fine. No. So what I think is really interesting about this is, as with so many things, when people try to censor something, it actually sort of blows up more. It gets more attention. Yeah, 100%. This publicity over this ongoing legal battle over this book kind of ironically increased lesbian visibility. Yeah, right, in both the US and the UK. And for a long time, it was like by far the best known lesbian novel. It was the first source of information about lesbianism that young people could find. It's divisive. It's still divisive. Some people think that it's really valuable. Some people think that because the main character expresses kind of self-hatred for her identity, that it's viewed as inspiring 
shame rather than fighting against it. But, you know, it's an absolute classic of lesbian literature and queer literature and has probably had like more of an impact than any other single text in that genre. So the, the main character was complex, basically. Absolutely. Which is what we need, because we need to like portray the realist, all the realistic angles of our experiences, you know? Yeah, very much so. As for when it actually finally got published uncensored, so in 1946, which was three years after Radcliffe's death, yeah. her partner Una Trowbridge wanted to include the book in a collected memorial edition of all her work, and this publisher wrote to the Home Office to ask whether the post-war Labour administration would allow the book to be republished. But he sort of also said that he actually wanted them to say no. He added a PS that said, I am not really anxious to do The Well of Loneliness and I'm rather relieved than otherwise by any lack of enthusiasm I may encounter in official circles. So he, he essentially <gasps> was like, I'm asking, but please say no. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking because I have to or someone's like pushing me to, but like not really. Yeah. Uh, so the Home Secretary told them that any publisher reprinting the book would risk prosecution and it wasn't until 1949 that an edition was brought out without legal challenge wow yeah prosecution over publishing a book scary to think of isn't it it is really scary what's interesting like the way that things have kind of changed over time so in the 1960s this book was still selling about 100,000 copies a year just in the u.s and there was a critic in 1972 who remarked how unlikely it was that this, quote, rather innocent book could have created such a scandal. <laughs> and then in 1974, it was read to the British public on BBC Radio 4's Books at Bedtime. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the 60s and 70s certainly weren't chased. <laughs> right, exactly. And look back on it now, it's just like, how did this ever like how did anyone ever have a problem with this i can imagine them now like someone organizing like a banned books meet up and they're all like oh what delicious stuff are we going to hear about and then it's like mostly a story about feelings <laughs> yeah it's like mostly just sadness <laughs> oh no yeah so just to kind of round out the the story um so radcliffe lived with una trowbridge in london and then in east sussex for the rest of her life but she had affairs with a bunch of women during that time um, including an actress called Ethel Walters and she continued to receive a bunch of awards and to be involved in lots and lots of different organisations uh, so she received a gold medal from something called the Eichel Berger Humane Awards mm. uh, she was a member of the Pen Club which is a worldwide association of writers she was on the Council for the Society for Physical Research a fellow of the Zoological Society and was listed at number 16 in the top 500 lesbian and gay heroes in the pink paper. Yay! Yeah. So 1934, she contracted something called enteritis, which is essentially an inflammation of the small intestine. They hired a woman called Evgenia Sulin, who was a Russian nurse, to care for her. Um, they ended up having an affair, <laughs> which Una knew about, and this says painfully tolerated, so... Again, with the like mm, dubiously consensual non-monogamy here, it's like it's more like she's she's having affairs and her partners are sort of putting up with it rather than anything. Yeah, she was a very charismatic person. It seems like it. Yeah, she was diagnosed with cancer of the colon in 1943, and then there was various kind of operations and things, but they were unsuccessful. Um, and she died at the age of 63 later that year. Yes, yeah, 7th of October 1943, she died. Wow. In London and the uh, the house at thirty seven Holland Street where they lived, there's a there's one of those blue plaques from English Heritage there. So we should go and go and see that on our WV Everything on tour adventure at some point. Definitely. Oh my god! Wow. That is the story. It's kind of women versus literary censorship and homophobia, I guess. Yeah. God and gender roles and norms and oh, well done, Jess. Good job. That yeah. was a great one. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this one since the beginning. It was actually one of the first ones I thought of because I thought it would be really interesting. Oh, one more fun fact. So in late 1928, after this whole trial had gone on and been resolved, this anonymous verse was published called The Sink of Solitude, <laughs> which kind of just makes fun of everyone on on both sides of this it sort of endorses the view that homosexuality is innate and that the the work shouldn't be censored and things 
but it also this 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 one source says it portrayed Hall as a humorless moralist who had a great deal in common with the opponents of her novel. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely an egoic um, perspective that I'm picking up on here. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So I just thought that was funny and, and interesting. But yeah, so that's, uh, that is that is our story of 1920s literary censorship and weirdness about queer people and all those things. Amazing. You know, and lesbianism is still so like invalidated and invisible compared to gay men these yeah. days you know it's still a very current issue there's this really great subreddit called Sappho and her friends oh interesting and it's just like pictures and clips from books where it's very clearly about lesbians but it'll say you know they were roommates forever <laughs> and it's like yeah of course they were yeah um I do enjoy that one but it is also like capturing that theme that quite serious theme underneath yeah, absolutely. Oh, I will, I will have to check that out. We'll have to link to it in the show notes. So for all the L's and B's and femme on femmes out there, we love you. And the gender nonconformists, keep it up. We do. You are great. <laughs> it's very sad to me that she didn't live long enough to see her book actually get published and become tremendously popular. Or get uncensored, rather. Mm-hmm. You know, quite often, um, sometimes nothing changes. Or, yeah, when it does, it isn't in their lifetime, you know. Yeah. So... Shall we do Basic Bitch Gratitude Corner? Yeah! Do you want to go first? BBG, BBGL. Um, <laughs> we need that on a yeah, t-shirt. I'm, Hashtag BBGL. I'm really grateful for my friend Lorraine up in um, Dublin that I stayed with this weekend. I just had a great time and it's great to be around other neurodivergents and just be like yourself and be functioning and not masking and... Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm really grateful for um, for therapists and people who like do a lot of emotional labor yes. for the various communities that I'm in. Um, you know, it's hard when you're a therapist and you're in a community. You It's difficult to know when the hat is on or off, but I know there is individuals that are doing a lot of support work and are keeping things together for the various communities that are grieving right now over my friend. Um, I'll leave it there, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, that's that's lovely. I have to come up with one now, don't I? You're not allowed to say cats. You're not allowed to say coffee. You're not allowed to say walks. Oh. <laughs> I sort of feel like I already did some of mine at the beginning. I am endlessly grateful for my friend Josh, who I have now known for over twelve years, who has been in my life for longer than any romantic relationship I've ever had, and is is just is just all around a wonderful, wonderful human being. So. I'm, I'm grateful for long-standing friendships and people mm. who stick with you through years and are, yeah, just, just that kind of, that having that kind of friendship is, 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 is really, really valuable. And I'm grateful for the small things that feel really significant now post-pandemic. As I mentioned at, at, at the beginning, we've uh, just booked to go on holiday, which is, which is really, really exciting and I'm, I'm, I'm super, super excited about. But honestly, there were so many just like smaller, more everyday things that I missed so much and that it's really nice to be able to do again. So I'm, I'm grateful for those little like everyday things that make life worth living that we can do again now. Yay. Yeah. Me too. Good. Yeah. So I think that is it for today. So we will see you again in two weeks uh, when Grace will be picking the fabulous person that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. But until then, fight censorship and love women. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone. Bye! Bye! I think I've seen that porno. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god. We'll link to it in the show notes. No. <laughs>